in one hand in Acts chapter number 20. As I said to you when we started, the, the, this meeting is not designed just to be a Bible class and a Bible study. You, you get plenty of that in, in, the, uh, in the school and so forth. I'm not, we're certainly not trying to avoid studying the Bible. That's what we're here for. But my purpose here is not just to have a, a, a Bible class with you. It's more, I'm thinking more about the ministry and, and trying to challenge you. I, I'm not trying to bring you here to teach you how to do some things to go home and do. I'd rather you understand that you're being taught through the school how to understand the Word of God and then take what the Word of God says and, and apply it to where you are in an appropriate way. What we do to preach the Word in Chicago might not look like the way you preach it where you are because you might need different techniques, a different language, a different whatever, skin to put it in. But you can still do the same thing. You can do what I said about I did in Alabama, came to Chicago, thought the ministry was different, and then it dawned on me the ministry is still 1 Timothy 2, 4, no matter where I went. And if you want a purpose, if you want the, the sum total of a, of, a, of a purpose statement for the ministry, I think 1 Timothy 2, 4 is a great one. God our Savior will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. How clearer, how much more purposeful, how much more focused, how much simpler can it be? has nothing to do with building buildings or, or, or movements or monuments or tearing down something. It has to do with getting some understanding that the work of the ministry is informing the church of the body of Christ, which takes place by people getting saved, trusting the, the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, hearing the gospel of grace and believing it, and then growing to perfection in Christ, having Christ formed in you. And that growing process is what that godly edifying that the function of the local church is for. And that is you assimilate the doctrine, you have Christ formed in you, and then you have a context in which, in which that, uh, that works out in life and, and does uh, exactly what uh, the passage in Ephesians 3 talks about when it says making all men see what's the fellowship of the mystery. We'll get to that in a minute. I want to start with you in, in, in 2 Timothy 4. Verse number 7, because if you're thinking about what's ahead, we, we're where we are with the irrelevance of the church. We're not in the church militant, the church triumphant. We're not in the things. You're in a situation where the church is completely irrelevant to the culture you live in. Christendom itself has become irrelevant to the, to the world you live in. And there's this tremendous social change and upheaval that's taking place. All of the things that... When you think about America and manifest destiny and what makes America great and all those things, you list any of those things, list them on a piece of paper, and they're all gone. And what's left is just the shell of what was there, economically, socially, politically, and religiously. And it's crumbling. The psalmist said, what shall the righteous do if the, if the foundations be destroyed? What shall the righteous do? Well, all you can do is watch the thing fall around your ears. It, we've come to that place in our, and we've, we've gone over the tipping point where there's more of them than there are of us. That's why they're vocal and, they, and, and, and they, they sense it. I can remember 15 years ago hearing Barney Frank, a, a homosexual uh, congressman on C-SPAN, which is my favorite TV show program, uh, channel. I can remember hear, watching Barney Frank years ago, 15 years ago at least, talking about uh, the senator from South Carolina, no, the other one. He's dead now. He's a Christian guy. No, his name just, I, I had his name in mind. Anyway, he's talking about him, and he says, we don't have to respect those guys. Their views are wrong, and we've been quiet too long. Now, he didn't say that out in public. He said it to a group of his party loyalists. But he's talking about his homosexual views. You know, he's a homosexual. And these guys think that we should be in the closet. We need to be out. And when these senators get up there and say, we don't have to respect them. We need to mock them. Now, what he was saying behind closed doors, they're saying out in the public streets. And the senator can't say what he says out in public. 
You just had a guy, the head of Mozilla, you know what that is? It's the company that started Firefox, the, the browser. It's the most popular browser, the best browser you can get on, the, on your computer. You guys don't know what that is. Anyway, here's a guy who starts a multi-billion dollar company, and because he gave money to, to a four or five years ago to a proposition in California that was to say that marriage is between one man and one woman, because he gave them money to, 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 for that, he lost his job as the CEO of the company he founded. Now, you talk about clout. You talk about a mafia. Bill Maher was right. The gay, lesbian cabal has become a mafia. And you can't speak. Now, I say that to tell you that's where the culture is gone. So when you think preaching the gospel is just a wonderful thing everybody's going to accept you to do, you've got to understand there ain't nobody out there listening, interested in hearing you, and they're going to mock you to, as best they can, shut you up any way they can, run you back into the building the best they can. You should understand the world that's coming isn't going to be like the one we, that, that's been here, but it's been here before. Where I live in Bloomingdale, where the old church building on Neva was, 22 miles. When we first started making that trip with our family, back in the 80s when we bought that building, moved from down to the city out to Neva, I would pass by a Baptist church and a Methodist church and a Presbyterian church and a Catholic church and a Lutheran church and a Baptist church and a Bible church on that trip. Now, if I make that trip from my house to that building, I pass first by a Hindu temple, then I go by a Muslim mosque. Then I go by two more Hindu temples. And then a great big old Muslim mosque, all of which used to be churches, except one of them. I went to Singapore years ago. Ted and I went with Dan Gross. We walked down the street, and there's a Sikh temple. There's a Buddhist temple. There's a Muslim mosque. There's a... Hindu temple, there's a Christian church. You go to the Philippines, same kind of thing. Go to Malaysia, same kind of thing. Paganism everywhere. Now it's in Chicago. Just a block, a couple, about four blocks from where I live, my wife and I were riding up the street Friday morning going to buy groceries. For, you're going to eat in a few minutes. We stopped at a light. They just men walking across the street in hordes, a Muslim mosque. It's Friday prayer time. place packed out. I'm looking up in the neighborhood, and here they come, all decked out in the regalia. Glendale Heights. Hundreds of people at the mosque come out of the neighborhood. The world's been that way. It's just been America that hadn't. They're here now. That world that was paganized is the world Paul lived in. Now, my point to you is you don't need to be scared of that. See, you're scared because you see the crumbling of the culture that you used to have, and that's too bad. It's gone. But it's, it, it, you know, it, 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 it is too bad. It was a, it was a, but Western civilization, is, is the, the things that built it are, are, are no longer viable. Now, they're not all going to go away, and America's not going to go away, and I wouldn't count America out. You just got to understand it's going to be different. And during the wintertime, that sea change takes place. It's right in the middle of the wintertime, which is where we are now, is when the tipping point comes. And all of the things you're watching take place, the Affordable Care Act, for example, one of the characteristics of the wintertime is a reunification of, of the collective mind around a problem and the, and the calling on the government to solve the problem, you're watching that happen. You, go to, you, you, you decry the government. And you say, well, they're, they're doing things that aren't constitutional. Well, hello. Can you name me one party that hadn't done that in the last 150 years? Since the Civil War, nobody's cared anything about the Constitution except as an excuse to do what they wanted to do. And when it didn't let them do what they wanted to do, they did it anyway. And you think the dude's doing it now, just the first ones? 
Well, the reason you think that is because they're not your guys. When your guys are doing it, it was okay. <laughs> and if you think it's okay now, it's because the guy doing it now is your guy, and the other guy, you didn't like him doing it because he wasn't your guy. And when you talk about it, it's your guy, it means you're not getting anything out of it. Your economic and social interests are more important to you than the truth of God's Word. Because if the truth of God's Word was important to you, you'd say, nation building isn't the issue. That's not my fight out here. The gospel's my fight. And all of them are against it. They all have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. And you wouldn't be thinking that you need to be out there reclaiming the culture. You'd be out there trying to preach the gospel. And if you got out there trying to preach the gospel, you'd get what preaching the gospel gets you. That's not a seat at the table, dude. Brother Art back there, he went in WYLL. You remember that debate? You, that little, he, he goes to WYLL, the radio station up here. They wanted me to come. I couldn't go. I said, Art, come. Art goes. And he said, we well, you have a Catholic, Episcopalian, and a bunch of, bunch of different denominational guys in a round table, you know. You get a bunch of preachers together, it's professional courtesy. We just, you know going to be collegial. They kept asking about it, and Art kept saying, well, you know what the Bible says. <laughs> <laughs> then the Catholic would talk, and the other guy talked, and the other guy, and Mark come back, but the Bible says. <laughs> and pretty soon they kept coming around, they'd skip Art. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> and it, even if you get to the table, they'd ignore you. The world Paul lived wasn't any different than the world that's coming. That's my point. So I think the world that's coming is going to be an exciting time. I'm sorry my grandkids won't get to enjoy some of the liberty and some of the freedoms and some of the excitement and some of the leisure and some of the pleasures that I've enjoyed. They'll have, they'll have theirs. But Christ, the gospel, the truth of God's Word, the Bible, still the same. And Paul lived in a world. Boy, if you read about the world Paul lived in, it was tough. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, he says, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. It's over. I have fought a, f a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. I fought a good fight. I fled those things that needed to flee. I followed the things that needed to follow. The fight came, and I got engaged in the war, and I, was, I fought the good fight. I finished my course. Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Verse 23 says, The Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. If you knew that everywhere you went, bonds and afflictions, people are going to try to put you in jail, people are going to try to beat you up, try to steal your possessions, you're going to have peril here, peril there, peril the other place, you'd probably stay home. Because you think Christianity is designed to be lived on flowery beds of ease to make your life sweet, kind, and, 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 and comfy, and everybody love you, and everything go fine, where you just enjoy yours, and that's the idea you've got about life. How do I know that? You're an American. Paul didn't know anything about life that way. He said, none of that, what's the chaff to the wind? None of that moved me. Neither count, for none of these things move me, neither counted I, count I my life dear unto myself. Now, if you get a guy like that, what are you going to do with him? Somebody says, you do that again, I'll shoot you. He says, shoot. It's going to blow me to glory. What difference? It, I don't count my life dear to him. The world doesn't understand that kind of guy. The things that I have aren't the issue with me. Are the things that you have the issue with you? I've said it for years. 
if the, Lord, if the Lord called us home today, the rapture took place today, some of us he'd have to snatch two or three times to get us loose from the earth to take us to heaven. <laughs> we got our roots down so hard. Listen, if you're younger and you're starting out in life, you need to be careful what you let yourself love. You need to be careful what you let your family, your, your, your home life hold dear. And I'm not saying don't take care of your family. Paul said to do that. I'm saying to take care of it in a way that's real, not buying into the lie program. None of these things can't move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course. So if you, if you count it your life dear and you do that, you're not going to finish the course with joy. I love that, that I might finish my course with joy. You know that's what was in his heart in 2 Timothy 4. But go over there and look at 2 Timothy 4. He's in jail. All of his buddies have left him. He's broke. He doesn't have a coat for wintertime. Think about that. His retirement plan was zilch. And I think that's the way the great apostle ended up. People say, well, the ministry is planned poverty. <laughs> well, for a lot of folks it is. Paul said, that didn't bother me. That I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable. Steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You ought to spend a little time thinking about what it means to be steadfast and unmovable. At first you think they're the same things, don't you? Obviously they're not. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain in the Lord. Years ago, I started writing down names of people next to that verse that exemplified that verse. For most of you, if I began to call the names, you wouldn't know them. Eldon Davis, Bill Cash, Roy Faber, Franklin Anderson, Bob Price, guys like that, that I knew. I'm talking about guys I didn't know. That I used as a, I said, there goes that verse in life right there. What that's saying is sort of what he told Titus over there. He said, I left you in Crete to set things in order. He said, it's too soon to quit. Keep going. You need to stay the course. If there's anything I'd tell you about the future, it would be finish well. That's what Paul did. And he said because he finished well, there was a crown. There was a reward. And it wasn't just for him. It was for anybody else that finished well. Well, go back to 2 Timothy 2. What would finishing well look like? Let me give you a couple of things that just are on my heart about that. Finishing well would look like 2 Timothy, frankly. Look at chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2. Thou therefore, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Boy, I love that verse. 
It didn't say be strong by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. It said be strong in the grace. Ephesians, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Not be, don't, it's not come along and let the Lord strengthen you. It's be strong in who God has made you in Christ. Your strength is in the cross. Your strength is in the, the life of Christ. Your strength is in the grace of God, all that He's given you through the cross work of Christ. That's where your strength is. Don't look at yourself and say, am I strong? Am I, am I doing it? Am I a failure? Am I making it? Look to Him and say, there's my strength. It's Him. It's His life in me. Let that be your, that's where your strength is. Be strong in the grace and all that God has given you in Christ Jesus. When failure comes, look to Calvary. When challenges come, look to the cross. You need to be loved, look to Calvary. (laughs) The world ain't going to love you. I've been married almost 45 years, and I can tell you there there are moments when your wife doesn't love you. (laughs) Uh, They say, "I, I I, I love you, but I don't like you. I ain't figured out the difference between those two things. <laughs> you know, the guy's arguing with his wife trying to tell her that women talk twice as much as men do. You heard that story? And she says, that's because we have to repeat everything. <laughs> he looked at her and said, Huh? If you get your needs for love and meaning and purpose in life met in Christ, then you don't need to use your spouse to have your needs met. You're free to serve out of having an identity that's complete. If you get your needs for purpose and meaning and joy in life met in Christ, then you don't need to use your ministry to advance yourself or to get your approbation. It'll never give you any gain because you already got everything. The security is in Him and the sufficiency of His grace. The things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall teach others also. Be looking for that third generation. Sociologists will tell you that it takes four generations to change a culture. That's why I'm telling you, you're not going to turn this thing around in in our culture. You don't turn it around in one generation. It takes four, it takes three generations. It's the fourth one that's got the change. Any, Any sociologist, missionary outfit, they tell you about that. The change that's taking place in our culture didn't take place this week, last week. It started in the early 1900s. And the people that changed it took the long view. They're all dead and in hell now. But the fruit of their labor is going on. You need to take the long view in your ministry. I told you in the first class in the school, the curriculum class, that when I let you into Grace School of the Bible, I take my ministry, you take my ministry into your hands. Because the the proof of a ministry is to be able to communicate the truth to the next guy who then communicates it to the next guy. And it's not until it's been communicated to that downline guy that this has been successfully done. I believe Amway took that verse and that's where they got the circles from. How many of you don't know what Amway is? If you're my age, everybody my age has been to Amway meetings. Almost everybody my age has belonged to Amway. Because you'd go to the meeting, they'd sign you up whether you wanted to or not. But they do the circles, you know, and the, the exponential growth and stuff. That's exactly what that verse is about. Verse 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier 
of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. That's why we call this soldier's training for service. You have to endure hardness. There's a war going on. There's a battle. And everybody that you talk to isn't going to like what you got to say to them. Hardness. There are some hard hearts out there. And you endure hardness. You go into the battle understanding that there are some hard hearts out there that you're going to need to talk to and you're going to face those hard hearts. And grace is going to go against their system and their thinking, even though their system and their thinking isn't working. You're going to talk to lost people, and they're not going to want to hear that they're lost, that they can't save themselves. That's going to go against their whole thinking process. You're going to talk to saved people and tell them you're not Israel and that law performance isn't getting you anywhere and you're, you're not going to save the nation and, you know, if my people that are called by my name should pray and, 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 and you, aren't, you aren't going to, God isn't going to heal your land because it's not his land to start with. They go, oh, where'd you come from? Didn't you hear about our founding? And didn't you hear about manifest destiny? And I said, yeah, and didn't you hear about the divine right of kings? It's about as much sense. It's all a bunch of Catholic nonsense. Calvinist heresy. And people aren't going to hear that. And you go into the battle knowing that. And you try to be nice and you try to be sweet. <laughs> as you can be. And you speak words of grace seasoned with salt and you speak the truth in love and you're going to discover they aren't going to want to hear it anyway. And what do you do? You endure it. You don't say, well, forget it. You say, but this is my task. I'm a soldier. I'm not on the parade ground. Look at chapter the first thing you need to do is you need to man the front lines. When you go out of here, if you get anything out of this, go home with a conviction that I'm going to go back to where I live and I'm going to get on the front line of the battle and I'm going to be in the battle on the front line. I'm not going to be a parade ground soldier. I'm not going to be in the, in the medic corps. I'm not going to be back doing potato potato peeling. I'll do whatever I need to do, but my goal is a front line. Look at chapter 4, verse number 2. Preach the Word. That's the front line. Be instant in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Don't do the ministry opportunity halfway. Do it all the way. Pedal to the metal. Do the work of an evangelist. When I think about that, come with me if you will here. Hold on to that. Come over to Acts chapter 20. When he says do the work of an evangelist, he's not talking about be a Billy Graham or a Billy Sunday, grand stadiums and, 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 and big, big, uh, big show kind of stuff. He's talking about one-on-one, -on -one, face to face personal work with people. He's talking about being a personal soul winner in the terms of the old timers. He's talking about you taking every opportunity and making the ones you can that you can to personally, face-to-face, -face, 
one-on-one, -on -one, share the gospel with lost people. Listen, a lost person can listen to a radio program and laugh and mock it. They can watch a television program and poo-poo it. It's a lot harder to do it when they're looking you dead in the eyeball. You know that? Acts chapter 20, verse 20. Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders about his ministry in Ephesus. He said, and I, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Now, you know, when you start right there, you know you're going to get in trouble. If you kept back nothing that was profitable, you know that they're not going to like to hear some of what they hear. They're not going to think it's profitable. They're over there claiming Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're telling them that's not you. They're over here, you know, oh, what do you think about the prayer of Jabez? <laughs> Why, you're a killjoy. I bet God don't do much down there where you live, does he? Okay. Paul said, I didn't, I didn't hold back in. I saw, I saw what you needed, and I, I gave it to you. Now, he didn't do it in a mean spirit. If you look at verse number 19, he says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying away of the Jews. Here are the Jews trying to kill him. These are the people, Paul says, it's breaking my heart that they're lost. I could wish myself a curse for Christ for these dudes. My heart's desire to God in prayers that they'd be saved, and they're out here trying to kill him. And he said, I'm preaching to them with humility of mind. Paul was a rabbinical scholar. He could have strutted in there and said, you sit down and shut up. I know more. I forgot more than you know. He didn't do that. He wept over them. Has it been a while since you wept over any lost people that you know? I'm just asking. Paul's your pattern. He said, you know my manner of life. Well, what did he do? That's what he did. You know why you weep over people? You get concerned over them. You love them. He said, they don't love me. He loved them anyway. Why? Because there's someone Christ died for. Look, I, don't, I, I think of somebody, you know, some hot and tot off in some part of a country I couldn't even name. I don't, how do I love them? I don't know them. But there's a whole bunch of people I do know. See, that gets kind of personal, doesn't it? Now we're not just talking onward Christian soldiers. We're talking about you and me. I kept back nothing that was profitable to you. But have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. <clears throat> That's public, out here on display, everybody knows it. House to house is, that's personal. You invite somebody into your house, that's one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Face-to-face -face effort, the sacrifice that it takes to do that. Let me encourage you something. When you go home, make it a priority to spend some time talking to lost people. I have to work at that. I can spend a week of my life and never talk to a lost person except on the phone when they call with the telemarketing. I've been saved 50 years. I've been in the ministry almost that long. I've been at this church 35 years. I've been with the school all these years. My life revolves around doing the work of the ministry among saints. So if I have to make an effort to be around some of you people, some of you are privileged to have the opportunity to rub shoulders with lost people every day. 
I can't, I don't, I don't get there. So I have to go out of my way to do it. Can I tell you, small talk and I are not friends. I'm not a small talk genius. I don't do, I don't do small talk very well. I'll sit down in the room next to you and sit there for two hours. We never have a conversation unless you want to do it. I'm just not a small talk guy. I, I just not that I don't like to talk to people. I do. I just don't. I just don't. It's just not me. I can go in a room of hundred people. Nobody say a word to me, and I'm just as happy as if they did. In fact, a lot of times I'm happier than if they did. Now, some of you, if you get in a room of ten people and everybody didn't talk to you for five minutes, you're mad. You're, you're you think you think something's wrong. I got you know I got spinach in my teeth or my my, my dress isn't right or something. You 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 can't stand that. You got you got such a leg up on me on that. It's just so much. But you know what I've done? I've learned how to do that. I've learned, for example, when I go to when I travel, my tendency is to go to the airport, go sit in the corner, and read a book. And I can do that. God's not mad at me if I do that. But I've also learned that I can talk to lost people. And so I set myself a goal every time I go to Detroit. I try to find at least one person on the way and one person on the way back to share the gospel with. I don't always get to do it. But I got I'm out. Oscar, you what all you say? I'm a bird dog. I'm bird. Do- I'm looking. You know what that does? It takes some effort. Now, why do I do that? I do that so God says, "Oh, Ricky, you're just so wonderful." Listen, the Lord thinks I'm wonderful in His Son. He can't think about me. He cares about His Son. But because I am in His Son, and I am a saint of the Most High God, and I do have something that's valuable. And it is my Father's will that those people be. I, look at, I, I began to look at people and say, you know what they are? Those are potential members of the body of Christ. I came out of a restaurant. Four big old burly, hairy-faced, hair sticking out from under their arms, out of their, their shirts, guys, motorcycles sitting out, outside. They're sitting there, mm, mm, daring anybody to come out of the restaurant because they've got to walk by them. And I saw them, and the people I was with, they were paying the bill. And I walked out, and I walked up to the guy that looked like he was a ringleader, and I said, hi, I wonder if anybody's ever loved you enough to ask you if you knew, if you fell off that bike out there and, you know, died, where you'd spend eternity. (laughs) No. No. I said, no what? Nobody ever asked you or you don't know? He said, nobody ever asked me. And I said, boy, you know, I bet you've met many Christians in your life, and I apologize for them not thinking enough of you to ask you that because our God, God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that Jesus Christ would save you and God commended his love for you at Calvary and that Christ died for you. If I could show you out of God's word what God's... And you know, you know what happened? Those four guys and another guy came in and listened to the gospel, and three of them trusted Christ. And I did... Listen, in my, in my thinking, I'd just walk by them. Other people walk by and say, in disgust, I can't, 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 can't dress like... I got no idea why a grown man would dress like those guys are dressing, unless he's got a screw loose. <laughs> but it's not my business. They don't come home with me. <laughs> but there's an opportunity to share the gospel with them. And you know what? That's a neat thing to have done. It's an exciting, finish your course with joy. Need to have some things to rejoice in. Serving the Lord is exciting. When I was a teenager, my first great lesson at witnessing was the opposite of what I said to you last night. I took gospel tracts, stamped my name, Ricky Jordan, my phone number on the back of them, and put them in every locker in Murphy High School in Mobile. 3,000 students. Two days later, over the PA system, Richard Jordan, report to the principal's office. 
The whole school hears this. I go into the principal's office. In fact, it wasn't Murphy, it was Maines. But anyway, I, I go to the principal's office, and he's a big guy. He's sitting there, and he's got a table full of those tracks. <laughs> Did you put these in lockers? And I, I thought, uh-oh. And I said, yes, sir, have you read it? He said, son, I'm asking the questions. Do you know we've got a policy against littering? I said, mister, that's not littering. That's God's Word. That's good news. He said, every locker, this man, one of the security guys, take you around, oh, you take it out of every locker. So I had to go around with the security, open every locker with a key, and I get the track out. Well, a bunch of them were empty, so I got those. And I learned something. I made a mistake of putting my name on there. <laughs> no, I think you should put your name on the tracks, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Look back at chapter 1. When you go home, lead your, lead your fellowship. If you're young and you don't have a lot of ministry activities to be involved in, that's where you ought to start. I thank God I started working as a teenager at a rescue mission. I had a chance to present the gospel personally somewhere from 10 to 40 people every day. I had a chance to go preach on the street, preaching bars and pool halls and jails and street corners. And a guy called me the other day from Mexico and said, Do you remember going down to that pool hall down there in Powell Fox Avenue in Pensacola and standing up on the, on the fire plug and preaching in the window? <laughs> God threw us out from inside, wouldn't let us. I said, Yeah, I, I remember that. This guy was a big, tall fellow named John, and I stood, I stood on the fire plug and preached, and he stood there holding me so I didn't fall off, <laughs> preaching in the window that the guy couldn't close. And you say, well, you're just a nuisance. Yeah, we were, just, we were being a nuisance. We were young. We were foolish. But I thank God I can look back there and see opportunity after opportunity to get in the battle. And I see young men go through life and never get a chance to do that, little young believers and it adds something to your ministry later on. Go back and you take your people. I talked to a preacher a week before last, and he said, you know, Brother Jordan, you're answering questions nobody's asking me. And I told him, so you know what? You just hadn't been in the battle yet. You get in the battle, you take your people in the battle, and you know what? The answers to the questions get much more precious to them. And all of a sudden, that answer that they've been hearing you give, that it was just a theory, now they need it, they pull it out of the quiver, and they use it, and that becomes a sword in their hand that they cleave to. You make a soldier out of them. Get on the front lines. Be interested in other people that are doing it. People that are preaching the gospel in places you can't go. Missions and that kind of stuff. But that will never really be there if it doesn't start with you. Get on the front lines. Develop a heart for lost people. Develop a heart for saved people that are captive to the religious system. You do that, you're going to find it's going to be hard. So 2 Timothy 1 verse 8, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. He doesn't, the spirit of fear doesn't come from God. Giving you the spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. The testimony of the Lord is the testimony of his prisoner. The testimony of the Lord is the testimony that he gives to you and me through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And he says, me his, not his apostle, but his prisoner. Look at chapter 2, verse 9. 
talking about my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds, but the Word of God is not bound. They fought against Paul. They fought against his ministry. They fought against his, his, his authority. So when you go into them, you go in knowing that if you do what you ought to do, you're going to get into trouble. You're going to get into controversy. The fight's going to come. If you preach the gospel of the grace of God to lost people, you're going to get a controversy. You preach the truth of the word rightly divided to Christians captivated in, in, that, in, in the snare of the devil. You're going to get the, the fight's going to come. You're not going to have to seek it. It'll, it'll find you. It did Paul. Look, look back at Acts 13. Ray, would you ask them when they're ready for lunch? Acts 13, verse 44. The next Sabbath day came to almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And when James, uh, the Jews saw that the multitudes, the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. That's not true. He's lying to you. Blaspheming. That guy is of the devil. <laughs> that guy, blasphemy means to speak evil of it. That's not just contradicting it, that's condemning it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Come on to chapter 17. What? <laughs> yeah? We just had to we just had that joke. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> All right, 17 verse 3. Here's what Paul's doing. Uh, verse 2, Paul, as the matter was, and he, uh, went unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them. Where? He took the book. Opening and alleging. You see what Paul's doing? He's taking God's Word, and he's opening the Word, and he's saying, here's what it says. That's the ministry, folks. Has nothing to do with building buildings, getting more people in a building, getting the offerings up, getting your reputation out there. It has to do with taking that book, having it, taking it, opening it up, and saying, here's what it says. And then you let it do what it does. And you let it get you what it will get you. And often it will get you what it got Paul. Look down at verse 5. The Jews which believe not move with envy. Notice the motivation behind this stuff. L took unto them lewd fellows of the baser sort. Now that doesn't sound like a, a real nice crowd. It sounds sort of like them dudes at that restaurant. And gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. That's the kind of reaction. And Paul said, in the face of that, don't be ashamed. Don't go back. That's not me. You open. I said, that's what the book says. I didn't write it. He didn't consult me when he wrote it. But I can't change it. I just deliver it. Be on the front lines with that. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of His prisoner, the message He gave you today. And take that pattern that He gave you through Paul and apply it. And then you press toward the mark. Come with me if you want thing, if you would, Ephesians chapter 3.
Ephesians 3, verse 7. Earlier today, we were talking with some people, and they, they were quoting Ephesians 3, 9 to me. I want you to see this verse in its context just a second. Because there's something real important here that sometimes gets overlooked. Ephesians 3, when he's talking about the ministry, the mystery that's given to Paul, his ministry of it, verse 6, verse 7, he says, Whereof, talking about the gospel, verse 6, that the Gentiles might be fellow heirs into the same body and protectors of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Notice when he talks about the fellowship of the mystery. That's not the dispensation of the mystery. The New Bible has put it that way. If you need dispensation of the mystery, you go to Colossians chapter 1, you find that over there. This is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, what is the fellowship of the mystery? Well, the fellowship is back in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, not the same body with Israel, but the same body with Christ, and partakers of His promise, where? In Christ, how? By the gospel. When you trust the, the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary, by the virtue of what God has done for you at Calvary, He puts you into Jesus Christ. And when He puts you into Jesus Christ, He makes you a fellow heir of Christ. That would be a joint heir. <laughs> of the same body, your one body in Christ, reconciled to God in one body in Christ. And you're made a partaker of His promise. God has a plan and a purpose for the body of Christ that you become a partaker of. The promises in chapter 1, verse 9, and Titus chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. The fellowship of the mystery is that fellowship that you and I share together as members of the church, the body of Christ. You don't have to go out of Ephesians 3 to understand what the fellowship of the mystery is. And Ephesians 3, he says, I want you to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. When he says that, he's not just simply saying, I want you to make everybody understand it. He's talking about, I want you, to, I want you saints down there in Ephesus to understand that what God wants done is this message to be preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the, among the Gentiles, and then put on display among the Gentiles in the church, the body of Christ. That's why in 1 Timothy 3, he talks about the local church being the pillar and the ground of the truth, and that in that local church, God is manifest in the flesh. You understand? He's talking about taking the life that you have in Christ and putting it on display in the local church so that people can see it, work, live, operate, be validated, Christ manifests in our flesh. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I take the identity I have and live it out. And the way people understand it is by having the living, real, tangible evidence of it right there in front of them, opening the Word of God and saying, here's what it says and here's what it produces. Having the message validated by a life, a transformed life that demonstrates the truth of it. That's what you want to build. So when you think about the future, listen, it's clear. Instructions are, well, there's no question about them. We're to be engaged in a spiritual fight. We're to war good warfare. We're to be good soldiers. We're to keep fighting the fight until we finish our course. We're to be partnered with fellow soldiers. And we're not to be beating the air. We're to hit, be hitting them right on the kisser. <laughs> Delivering the goods. I held nothing back. 
But I opened and alleged, I opened, declared to you what the book said about what the issue is and let God's Word do its work. Can you understand God's Word will do its work if it's believed? I love that verse in Romans 10, verse 14. This verse never gets quoted. How shall they call upon Him in whom they have not believed? That's why you hear me say, you don't have to go anywhere, move a muscle. You don't even have to pray to get saved. In fact, pray don't keep you from getting saved. You get saved by believing. And then prayer is the work of your new man telling God, thank you. How should they call on him in whom they have not believed? How should they believe if they don't hear? And how should they hear if they don't have a preacher? And how shall they preach if they aren't sent? Well, God has sent us. If you be the preacher, somebody can hear and somebody then can believe and somebody can then be saved. Get on the front lines. <laughs> I think it's going to be one of the most exciting times. In fact, I believe right now is the most exciting, most, the most impactful decade of your life. If you're my age, you're looking to equip, you're looking to do what you've done, <coughs> finish strong, finish well. If you're younger in the transition period, you need to understand the bridge ministry you're going to have. And if you're young, you need to understand you're going to have a wonderful opportunity to see things move out ahead when you do. Remember, say, Brother Rick, you're going to be excited about hearing about it when, we get to, when, he, when you get the glory to tell me. But the issue is, that's the ministry. Don't let the culture around you decide what the ministry is. That's the context, the stage you go do the ministry. This is the ministry. All men saved come to the knowledge of the truth. You do that, you're on the front lines. You don't be ashamed of the word of Paul, the message given to you through Paul, because that's what works. That's what you've been given to proclaim. And as you do it, you endure the hardness because you know the battle's the Lord's. Okay? All right, well, that's wit and wisdom from an old guy. We're going to have lunch now. How are you going to do it, babe?